Hello ladies and gents, and welcome once again to Horror Babble. Today we're excited to commence Karnaki Week, in which we'll be telling the remaining three stories attributed to that most special of paranormal investigators, Thomas Karnaki. If you're unfamiliar with the exploits of Mr. Karnaki, be sure to visit the video description below for links to previous stories in the series. And so today, Karnaki will be telling us the tale of the Haunted Jarvi. The second and third tales will follow Wednesday and Friday, respectively. And this reading is dedicated to all of our Yellow and Cthulhu-level horror babblers over at Patreon. We thank you for your continued support. And as always, we hope you enjoy this one. The Haunted Jarvie by William Hope Hodgson Seen anything of Karnaki lately? I asked Arkwright when we met in the city. No, he replied. He's probably off on one of his jaunts. We'll be having a card one of these days, inviting us to number 472 Cheney Walk, and then we'll hear all about it. Queer chap, that. He nodded and went on his way. It was some months now since we four, Jessop, Arkwright, Taylor and myself, had received the usual summons to drop in at number 472 and hear Karnaki's story of his latest case. What talks they were! Stories of all kinds, and true in every word, yet full of weird and extraordinary incidents that held one silent and awed until he had finished. Strangely enough, the following morning brought me a curtly worded card telling me to be at number 472 at seven o'clock promptly. I was the first to arrive. Jessop and Taylor soon followed, and just before dinner was announced, Arkwright came in. Dinner over. Karnaki, as usual, passed round his smokes, snuggled himself down luxuriously in his favourite armchair, and went straight to the story we knew he had invited us to hear. "'I've been on a trip in one of the real old-time sailing ships,' he said without any preliminary remarks. "'The Jarvi, owned by my old friend, Captain Thompson. I went on the voyage primarily for my health,' but I picked on the old Jarvie because Captain Thompson had often told me there was something queer about her. I used to ask him up here whenever he came ashore, and try to get him to tell me more about it, you know. But the funny thing was, he never could tell me anything definite concerning her queerness. He seemed always to know, but when it came to putting his knowledge into words, it was as if he found that the reality melted out of it. He would end up usually by saying that you saw things, and then he would wave his hands vaguely, but— Further than that, he never seemed able to pass on the knowledge of something strange which he had noticed about the ship, except odd outside details. "'Can't keep men in her know-how,' he often told me. "'They get frightened, and they see things, and they feel things. And I've lost a power of men out of her. Fallen from aloft, you know. She's getting a bad name.' And then he'd shake his head, very solemnly. Old Thompson was a brick in every way. When I got aboard, I found that he had given me the use of a whole empty cabin, opening off my own as my laboratory and workshop. He gave the carpenter orders to fit up the empty cabin with shelves and other conveniences according to my directions, and in a couple of days I had all the apparatus, both mechanical and electric, with which I had conducted my other ghost hunts, neatly and safely stowed away, for I took a great deal of gear with me, as I intended to interest myself by examining thoroughly into the mystery about which the captain was at once so positive and so vague. During the first fortnight out, I followed my usual methods of making a thorough and exhaustive search. This I did with the most scrupulous care, but found nothing abnormal of any kind in the whole vessel. She was an old wooden ship, and I took care to sound and measure every casement and bulkhead, to examine every exit from the holds, and to seal all the hatches. These, and many other precautions I took, but at the end of the fortnight I had neither seen anything nor found anything. The old bark was just, to all seeming, a healthy average old-timer, jogging along comfortably from one port to another, and save for an indefinable sense of what I could now describe as abnormal peace about the ship, I could find nothing to justify the old captain's solemn and frequent assurances that I would see soon enough for myself. This he would say often, as we walked the poop together, afterwards stopping to take a long, expectant, half-fearful look 
at the immensity of the sea around. Then, on the eighteenth day, something truly happened. I had been pacing the poop as usual with old Thompson, when suddenly he stopped and looked up at the mizzen royal, which had just begun to flap against the mast. He glanced at the wind vane near him, and then ruffled his hat back and stared at the sea. "'Wind's dropping, mister. There'll be trouble to-night,' he said. "'Do you see yon?' And he pointed away to windward. "'What?' I asked, staring with a curious little thrill that was due to more than curiosity. "'Where?' "'Right off the beam,' he said. "'Come in from under the sun.' "'I don't see anything.' I explained after a long stare at the wide-spreading silence of the sea that was already glassing into a dead calm surface now that the wind had died. "'Yon shadow fixin,' said the old man, reaching for his glasses. He focused them, and took a long look, then passed them across to me and pointed with his finger. "'Just under the sun,' he repeated, "'coming towards us at the rate of knots.' He was curiously calm, and matter-of-fact, and yet I felt that a certain excitement had him in the throat so that I took the glasses eagerly and stared according to his directions. After a minute I saw it, a vague shadow upon the still surface of the sea that seemed to move towards us as I stared. For a moment I gazed fascinated, yet ready every moment to swear that I saw nothing, and in the same instant to be assured that there was truly something out there upon the water, apparently coming towards the ship. "'It's only a shadow, Captain,' I said at length. "'Just so, mister,' he replied, simply. "'Have a look over the stern to the norad. He spoke in the quietest way, as a man speaks who is sure of all his facts, and who is facing an experience he has faced before, and yet who salts his natural matter-of-factness with a deep and constant excitement. At the captain's hint, I turned about, and directed the glasses to the northward. For a while I searched, sweeping my aided vision to and fro, over the greying arc of the sea. Then I saw the thing plain in the field of the glass, a vague something, a shadow upon the water, and the shadow seemed to be moving towards the ship. "'That's queer,' I muttered, with a funny little stirring at the back of my throat. "'Now to the westward, mister,' said the captain, still speaking in his peculiar level way. I looked to the westward, and in a minute I picked up the thing, a third shadow that seemed to move across the sea as I watched it. "'My God, Captain!' I exclaimed. "'What does it mean?' "'That's just what I want to know, mister,' said the Captain. "'I've seen them before, and thought sometimes I must be going mad. Sometimes they're plain, and sometimes they're scarce to be seen, and sometimes they're like living things, and sometimes they're like naught at all but silly fancies. Do you wonder I couldn't name them proper to you?' I did not answer, for I was staring now expectantly towards the south along the length of the bark. Afar off on the horizon, my glasses picked up something dark and vague upon the surface of the sea. A shadow, it seemed, which grew plainer. "'My God!' I muttered again. "'This is real, this—' I turned again to the eastward. "'Coming in from the four points, ain't they?' said Captain Thompson, and he blew his whistle. "'Take them three royals off her,' he told the mate, "'and tell one of the boys to shove lanterns up on the sherpas. Get the men down smart before dark.' He concluded, as the mate moved off to see the orders carried out. "'I'm sending no men aloft to-night,' he said to me. "'I've lost enough that way.' "'They may be only shadows, Captain, after all,' I said, still looking earnestly at that far-off grey vagueness on the eastward sea, a bit of mist or cloud floating low. Yet though I said this, I had no belief that it was so. And as for old Captain Thompson, he never took the trouble to answer.' but reached for his glasses, which I passed to him. "'Getting thin, and disappearing as they come near,' he said presently. "'I know. I've seen them do that often, plenty before. They'll be close round the ship soon. But you nor me won't see them, nor no one else. But they'll be there. I wish twas morning. I do that.' He had handed the glasses back to me, and I had been staring at each of the oncoming shadows in turn. It was as Captain Thompson had said— as they drew nearer, they seemed to spread and thin out, and presently to become dissipated into the grey of the gloaming, so that I could easily have imagined that I watched merely four little portions of grey cloud, expanding naturally into impalpableness and invisibility. "'Wish I took them to gallants off her while I was about it,' remarked the old man presently. "'Can't think to send no one off the decks to-night, not unless there's real need.' He slipped away from me 
and peered at the aneroid in the skylight. Glass steady, anyhow, he muttered as he came away, seeming more satisfied. By this time the men had all returned to the decks, and the night was down upon us, so that I could watch the queer, dissolving shadows which approached the ship. Yet as I walked the poop with old Captain Thompson, you can imagine how I grew to feel. Often I found myself looking over my shoulder with quick, jerky glances, for it seemed to me that in the curtains of gloom that hung just beyond the rails, there must be a vague, incredible thing looking inboard. I questioned the captain in a thousand ways, but could get little out of him beyond what I knew. It was as if he had no power to convey to another the knowledge which he possessed, and I could ask no one else, for every other man in the ship was newly signed on, including the mates, which was in itself a significant fact. "'You'll see for yourself, mister,' was the refrain with which the captain parried my questions, so that it began to seem as if he almost feared to put anything he knew into words. Yet once, when I had jerked round with a nervous feeling that something was at my back, he said, calmly enough, "'Not to fear, mister, whilst you're in the light and on the decks.' His attitude was extraordinary in the way in which he accepted the situation. He appeared to have no personal fear. The night passed quietly until about eleven o'clock, when, suddenly and without one atom of warning, a furious squall burst on the vessel. There was something monstrous and abnormal in the wind. It was as if some power were using the elements to an infernal purpose. Yet the captain met the situation calmly. The helm was put down, and the sails shaken, while the three to-gallants were lowered. Then the three upper top sails. Yet still the breeze roared over us, almost drowning the thunder which the sails were making in the night. "'Split em to ribbons!' the captain yelled in my ear above the noise of the wind. "'Can't help it. I ain't sending no men aloft to-night unless she seems like to shake the sticks out of her. That's what bothers me.' For nearly an hour after that, until eight bells went at midnight, the wind showed no signs of easing, but breezed up harder than ever, and all the while the skipper and I walked the poop, he ever and again peering up anxiously through the darkness at the banging and the thrashing sails. For my part, I could do nothing except stare round and round at the extraordinarily dark night in which the ship seemed to be embedded solidly. The very feel and sound of the wind gave me a sort of constant horror, for there seemed to be an unnaturalness rampant in the atmosphere. But how much this was the effect of my overstrung nerves and excited imagination, I cannot say. Certainly, in all my experience, I had never come across anything just like what I felt and endured through that peculiar squall. At eight bells, when the other watch came on deck, the captain was forced to send all hands aloft to make the canvas fast, as he had begun to fear that he would actually lose his masts if he delayed longer. This was done, and the bark snugged right down. Yet, though the work was done successfully, the captain's fears were justified in a sufficiently horrible way, for as the men were beginning to make their way in off the wards, there was a loud crying and shouting aloft, and immediately afterwards a crash down on the main deck, followed instantly by a second crash. "'My God, two of them!' shouted the skipper, as he snatched a lamp from the forward binnacle. Then down onto the main deck, it was as he had said— Two of the men had fallen, or, as the thought came to me, been thrown from aloft and were lying silent on the deck. Above us in the darkness, I heard a few vague shouts, followed by a curious quiet, save for the constant blast of the wind, whose whistling and howling in the rigging seemed but to accentuate the complete and frightened silence of the men aloft. Then I was aware that the men were coming down swiftly and presently one after the other came with a quick leap out of the rigging, and stood about the two fallen men with odd exclamations and questions, which always merged off instantly into new silence. And all the time I was conscious of a most extraordinary sense of oppression, and frightened distress, and fearful expectation, for it seemed to me, standing there near the dead in that unnatural wind, that a power of evil filled all the night about the ship, and that some fresh horror was imminent. The following morning there was a solemn little service, very rough and crude, but undertaken with a nice reverence, and the two men who had fallen were tilted off from a hatch-cover and plunged suddenly out of sight. As I watched them vanish in the deep blue of the water, an idea came to me, 
and I spent part of the afternoon talking it over with the captain, after which I passed the rest of the time until sunset was upon us, in arranging the fitting up a part of my electrical apparatus. Then I went on deck and had a good look round. The evening was beautifully calm, and ideal for the experiment which I had in mind, for the wind had died away with a peculiar suddenness after the death of the two men, and all that day the sea had been like glass. To a certain extent I believe that I comprehended the primary cause of the vague but peculiar manifestations which I had witnessed the previous evening, and which Captain Thompson believed implicitly to be intimately connected with the death of the two sailormen. I believe the origin of the happenings to lie in a strange but perfectly understandable cause, i.e., in that phenomenon known technically as attractive vibrations. Arzam, in his monograph on induced hauntings, points out that such are invariably produced by induced vibrations, that is, by temporary vibrations set up by some outside cause. This is somewhat abstruse to follow out in a story of this kind, but it was on a long consideration of these points that I had resolved to make experiments, to see whether I could not produce a counter or repellent vibration, a thing which Hazam had succeeded in producing on three occasions, and in which I have had a partial success once, failing only because of the imperfectness of the apparatus I had aboard. As I have said, I can scarcely follow the reasoning further in a brief record such as this, neither do I think it would be of interest to you, who are interested only in the startling and weird side of my investigations. Yet, I have told you sufficient to show you the germ of my reasonings, and to enable you to follow intelligently my hopes and expectations in sending out what I hoped would prove repellent vibrations. Therefore, it was that when the sun had descended to within ten degrees of the visible horizon, the captain and I began to watch for the appearance of the shadows. Presently, under the sun, I discovered the same peculiar appearance of a moving greyness, which I had seen on the preceding night, and almost immediately Captain Thompson told me that he saw the same to the south. To the north and east we perceived the same extraordinary thing, and I at once set my electric apparatus at work sending out the strange repelling force to the dim, far shadows of mystery which moved steadily out of the distance, towards the vessel. Earlier in the evening the captain had snugged the bark right down to her topsails, for as he said, until the calm went he would risk nothing. According to him it was always during calm weather that the extraordinary manifestations occurred. In this case he was certainly justified for a most tremendous squall struck the ship in the middle watch, taking the fore upper topsail right out of the ropes. At the time when it came I was lying down on a locker in the saloon, but I ran up onto the poop as the vessel canted under the enormous force of the wind. Here I found the air pressure tremendous, and the noise of the squall stunning, and over it all and through it all I was conscious of something abnormal and threatening that set my nerves uncomfortably acute. The thing was not natural. Yet, despite the carrying away of the topsail, not a man was sent aloft. "'Let them all go,' said old Captain Thompson. "'I'd have shortened her down to the bare sticks if I'd done all I wanted.' About two a.m. the squall passed with astonishing suddenness, and the night showed clear above the vessel. From then onward I paced the poop with the skipper, often pausing at the break to look along the lighted main deck. It was on one of these occasions that I saw something peculiar. It was like a vague flitting of an impossible shadow between me and the whiteness of the well-scrubbed decks. Yet, even as I stared, the thing was gone, and I could not say with surety that I had seen anything. "'Pretty plain to see, mister,' said the captain's voice at my elbow. "'I've only seen that once before, and we lost half of the hands that trip. We'd better be at home, I'm thinking.' It'll end in scrapping her, sure. The old man's calmness bewildered me almost as much as the confirmation his remark gave that I had really seen something abnormal floating between me and the deck eight feet below us. "'Good Lord, Captain Thompson!' I exclaimed. "'This is simply infernal.' "'Just that,' he agreed. "'I said, mister, you'd see it if you'd wait. And this ain't the half. You wait till you see them looking like— little black clouds all over the sea round the ship, and moving steady with the ship. All the same, I ain't seen em aboard but the once. Guess we're in for it. How do you mean? I asked, but though I questioned him in every way, I could get nothing satisfactory out of him. 
You'll see, mister. You wait and see. She's a queer un, and that was about the extent of his further efforts and methods of enlightening me. From then on, through the rest of the watch, I leaned over the break of the poop, staring down at the main deck, and odd whiles taking quick glances to the rear. The skipper had resumed his steady pacing of the poop, but now and again he would come to a pause beside me, and ask, calmly enough, whether I had seen any more of them there. Several times I saw the vagueness of something drifting in the lights of the lanterns, and a sort of wavering in the air in this place and that, as if it might be an attenuated something having movement, that was half seen for a moment, and then gone before my brain could record anything definite. Towards the end of the watch, however, both the captain and I saw something very extraordinary. He had just come beside me, and was leaning over the rail across the break. Another of them there, he remarked in his calm way, giving me a gentle nudge, and nodding his head towards the port side of the main deck, a yard or two to our left. In the place he had indicated, there was a faint, dull, shadowy spot, seeming suspended about a foot above the deck. This grew more visible, and there was movement in it, and a constant, oily-seeming whirling from the centre outwards. The thing expanded to several feet across, with the lighted planks of the deck showing vaguely through. The movement from the centre outwards was now becoming very distinct, till the whole strange shape blackened and grew more dense, so that the deck below was hidden. Then, as I stared with the most intense interest, there went a thinning movement over the thing, and almost directly it had dissolved, so that there was nothing more to be seen than a vague rounded shape of shadow, hovering and convoluting dimly between us and the deck below. This gradually thinned out and vanished, and we were both of us left staring down at a piece of the deck where the planking and pitched seams showed plain and distinct in the light from the lamps that were now hung nightly on the sherpoles. "'Mighty queer that, mister,' said the captain meditatively as he fumbled for his pipe. "'Mighty queer.' Then he lit his pipe and began again his pacing of the poop. The calm lasted for a week with a sea-like glass, and every night without warning there was a repetition of the extraordinary squall, so that the captain had everything made fast at dusk, and waited patiently for a trade-wind. Each evening I experimented further with my attempts to set up repellent vibrations, but without result. I am not sure whether I ought to say that my meddling produced no result, for the calm gradually assumed a more unnatural permanent aspect, whilst the sea looked more than ever like a plane of glass bulged and on with the low oily roll of some deep swell. For the rest, there was by day a silence so profound as to give a sense of unrealness, for never a seabird hove in sight, whilst the movement of the vessel was so slight as scarce to keep up the constant creak-creak of spars and gear, which is the ordinary accompaniment of a calm. The sea appeared to have become an emblem of desolation and freeness, so that it seemed to me at last that there was no more any known world but just one great ocean going on for ever into the far distances in every direction. At night, the strange squalls assumed a far greater violence, so that sometimes it seemed as if the very spars would be ripped and twisted out of the vessel. Yet fortunately, no harm came in that wise. As the days passed, I became convinced at last that my experiments were producing very distinct results, though the opposite to those which I hoped to produce. For now, at each sunset, a sort of grey cloud resembling light smoke would appear far away in every quarter, almost immediately upon the commencement of the vibrations, with the effect that I desisted from any prolonged attempt, and became more tentative in my experiments. At last, however, when we had endured this condition of affairs for a week, I had a long talk with old Captain Thompson, and he agreed to let me carry out a bold experiment to its conclusion. It was to keep the vibrations going steadily at full power, from a little before sunset until the dawn, and to take careful notes of the results. With this in view, all was made ready. The royal and t'gallant yards were sent down, all the sails stowed, and everything about the decks made fast. A sea anchor was rigged out over the bows, and a long line of cable veered away. This was to ensure the vessel coming head to wind, should one of those strange squalls strike us from any quarter during the night. Late in the afternoon the men were sent into the forecastle, 
and told that they might please themselves and turn in or do anything they liked, but that they were not to come on deck during the night whatever happened. To ensure this, the port and starboard doors were padlocked. Afterwards, I made the first and the eighth signs of the Samar ritual opposite each doorpost, connecting them with triple lines crossed at every seventh inch. You've dipped deeper into the science of magic than I have, I cried, and you will know what that means. Following this, I ran a wire entirely around the outside of the forecastle and connected it up with my machinery, which I had erected in the sail locker aft. In any case, I explained to the captain, they run practically no risk other than the general risk which we may expect in the form of a terrific storm burst. The real danger will be to those who are meddling. The path of the vibrations will make a kind of halo round the apparatus. I shall have to be there to control, and I'm willing to risk it. But you better get into your cabin, and the three mates must do the same. This the old captain refused to do, and the three mates begged to be allowed to stay and see the fun. I warned them very seriously that there might be a very disagreeable and unavoidable danger, but they agreed to risk it, and I can tell you I was not sorry to have their companionship. I set to work, then, making them help where I needed help, and so presently I had all my gear in order. Then I led my wires up through the skylight from the cabin, and set the vibrator dial and trembler box level, screwing them solidly down to the poop deck, in the clear space that lay between the foreside of the skylight and the lid of the sail locker. I got the three mates and the captain to take their places close together, and I warned them not to move, whatever happened. I set to work then alone, and chalked a temporary pentacle about the whole lot of us, including the apparatus. Afterwards, I made haste to get the tubes of my electrical pentacle fitted all about us, for it was getting on to dusk. As soon as this was done, I switched on the current in the vacuum tubes, and immediately the pale sickly glare shone dull all about us, seeming cold and unreal in the last light of the evening. Immediately afterwards, I set the vibrations beating out into all space, and then I took my seat beside the control board. Here I had a few words with the others, warning them again whatever they might hear or see not to leave the pentacle, if they valued their lives. They nodded to this, and I knew that they were fully impressed with the possibility of the unknown danger that we were meddling with. Then we settled down to watch. We were all in our oilskins, for I expected the experiment to include some very peculiar behaviour on the part of the elements, and so we were ready to face the night. One other thing I was careful to do, and that was to confiscate all matches, so that no one should forgetfully light his pipe, for the light rays are paths to certain of the forces. With a pair of marine glasses, I was staring round at the horizon. All around, but miles away in the greying of the evening, there seemed to be a strange, vague darkening of the surface of the sea. This became more distinct, and it seemed to me, presently, that it might be a slight, low-lying mist far away about the ship. I watched it very intently, and the captain and the three mates were doing likewise through their glasses. "'Coming in on us at the rate of knots, mister,' said the old man in a low voice. "'This is what I call playing with L. I only hope it'll all come right.' That was all he said, and afterwards there was absolute silence from him and the others through the strange hours that followed. As the night stole down upon the sea, we lost sight of the peculiar incoming circle of mist— and there was a period of the most intense and oppressive silence to the five of us, sitting there, watchful and quiet, within the pale glow of the electric pentacle. A while later there came a sort of strange, noiseless lightning. By noiseless, I mean that while the hashes appeared to be near at hand, and let up all the vague sea around, yet there was no thunder. Neither, so it appeared to me, did there seem to be any reality in the flashes. This is a queer thing to say, but— it describes my impressions. It was as if I saw a representation of lightning, rather than the physical electricity itself. No, of course, I am not pretending to use the word in its technical sense. Abruptly, a strange quivering went through the vessel from end to end, and died away. I looked fore and aft, and then glanced at the four men who stared back at me with a sort of dumb and half-frightened wonder, but no one said anything. About five minutes passed with no sound anywhere, except the faint buzz of the apparatus and 
nothing visible anywhere except the noiseless lightning which came down, flash after flash, lighting the sea all around the vessel. Then a most extraordinary thing happened. The peculiar quivering passed again through the ship and died away. It was followed immediately by a kind of undulation of the vessel, first fore and aft, and then from side to side. I can give you no better illustration of the strangeness of the movement on that glass-like sea than to say that it was just such a movement as might have been given her had an invisible giant hand lifted her and toyed with her, canting her this way and that with a certain curious and rather sickening rhythm of movement. This appeared to last about two minutes, so far as I can guess, and ended with the ship being shaken up and down several times, after which there came again the quivering, and then quietness. A full hour must have passed, during which I observed nothing, except that twice the vessel was faintly shaken, and the second time this was followed by a slight repetition of the curious undulations. This, however, lasted but a few seconds, and afterwards there was only the abnormal and oppressive silence of the night punctured time after time by these noiseless flashes of lightning. All the time I did my best to study the appearance of the sea and atmosphere around the ship. One thing was apparent, that the surrounding wall of vagueness had drawn in more upon the ship, so that the brightest flashes now showed me no more than about a clear quarter of a mile of ocean around us, after which the sight was just lost in trying to penetrate a kind of shadowy distance that yet had no depth in it but which still lacked any power to arrest the vision at any particular point, so that one could not know definitely whether there was anything there or not, but only that one's sight was limited by some phenomenon which hid all the distant sea. Do I make this clear? The strange, noiseless lightning increased in vividness, and the flashes began to come more frequently. This went on till they were almost continuous, so that all the near sea could be watched with scarce an intermission. Yet the brightness of the flashes seemed to have no power to dull the pale light of the curious detached glows that circled in silent multitudes about us. About this time I became aware of a strange sense of breathlessness. Each breath seemed to be drawn with difficulty, and presently with a sense of positive distress. The three mates and the captain were breathing with curious little gasps, and the faint buzz of the vibrator seemed to come from a great distance away. For the rest, there was such a silence as made itself known like a dull, numbing ache upon the brain. The minutes passed slowly, and then, abruptly, I saw something new. There were grey things floating in the air about the ship which were so vague and attenuated that at first I could not be sure that I saw anything. But in a while there could be no doubt that they were there. They began to show plainer in the constant glare of the quiet lightning and growing darker and darker, they increased visibly in size. They appeared to be but a few feet above the level of the sea, and they began to assume humped shapes. For quite half an hour, which seemed indefinitely longer, I watched those strange humps like little hills of blackness floating just above the surface of the water, and moving round and round the vessel with a slow, everlasting circling that produced on my eyes the feeling that it was all a dream. It was later still that I discovered still another thing. Each of those great vague mounds had begun to oscillate as it circled round about us. I was conscious at the same time that there was communicated to the vessel the beginning of a similar oscillating movement, so very slight at first that I could scarcely be sure she so much as moved. The movement of the ship grew with a steady oscillation, the bows lifting first and then the stern, as if she were pivoted amidships. This ceased, and she settled down onto a level keel with a series of queer jerks, as if her weight were being slowly lowered again to the buoying of the water. Suddenly there came a cessation of the extraordinary lightning, and we were in an absolute blackness with only the pale sickly glow of the electric pentacle above us, and the faint buzz of the apparatus seeming far away in the night. Can you picture it all? The five of us there, tense and watchful and wondering what was going to happen. The thing began gently, a little jerk upward of the starboard side of the vessel, then a second jerk, then a third, and the whole ship was canted distinctly to port. It continued in a kind of slow rhythmic tilting with 
curious timed pauses between the jerks, and suddenly, you know, I saw that we were in absolute danger, for the vessel was being capsized by some enormous force in the utter silence and blackness of that night. "'My God, mister, stop it!' came the captain's voice, quick and very hoarse. "'She'll be gone in a moment. She'll be gone!' He had got onto his knees, and was staring round and gripping at the deck. The three mates were also gripping at the deck with their palms, to stop them from sliding down the violent slope. In that moment came a final tilting of the side of the vessel, and the deck rose up almost like a wall. I snatched at the lever of the vibrator and switched it over. Instantly the angle of the deck decreased, as the vessel righted several feet with a jerk. The righting movement continued with little rhythmic jerks, until the ship was once more on an even keel. And even as she righted, I was aware of an alteration in the tenseness of the atmosphere, and a great noise far off to starboard. It was the roaring of wind. A huge flash of lightning was followed by others, and the thunder crashed continually overhead. The noise of the wind to starboard rose to a loud screaming, and drove towards us through the night. Then the lightning ceased and the deep roll of the thunder was lost in the nearer sound of the wind, which was now within a mile of us, and making a most hideous bellowing scream. The shrill howling came at us out of the dark, and covered every other sound. It was as if all the night on that side were a vast cliff, sending down high and monstrous echoes upon us. This is a queer thing to say, I know, but it may help you to get the feeling of the thing, for that just describes exactly how it felt to me at the time, that queer, echoing, empty sense above us in the night, yet all the emptiness filled with sound on high. Do you get it? It was most extraordinary, and there was a grand something about it all, as if one had come suddenly upon the steeps of some monstrous lost world. Then the wind rushed out at us and stunned us with its sound and force and fury. We were smothered and half-stunned, the vessel went over onto her port side merely from pressure of the wind on her naked spars and side. The whole night seemed one yell, and the foam roared and snowed over us in countless tons. I had never known anything like it. We were all splayed about the poop, holding onto anything we could, while the pentacle was smashed to atoms so that we were in complete darkness. The storm burst had come down on us. Towards morning, the storm calmed, and by evening we were running before a fine breeze, yet the pumps had to be kept going steadily, for we had sprung a pretty bad leak, which proved so serious that we had to take to the boats two days later. However, we were picked up that night, so that we had only a short time of it. As for the Jarvi, she is now safely at the bottom of the Atlantic, where she had better remain forever. Carnacki came to an end, and tapped out his pipe. "'But you haven't explained,' I remonstrated. "'What made her like that? What made her different from other ships? Why did those shadows and things come to her? What's your idea?' "'Well,' replied Carnacki, "'in my opinion she was a focus. That is a technical term which I can best explain by saying that she possessed the attractive vibration that is the power to draw to her any psychic waves in the vicinity, much in the way of a medium.' The way in which the vibration is acquired, to use a technical term again, is of course purely a matter for supposition. She may have developed it during the years, owing to a suitability of conditions, or it may have been in her, of her, is a better term, from the very day her keel was laid. I mean the direction in which she lay the condition of the atmosphere, the state of the electric tensions, the very blows of the hammers, and the accidental combining of materials suited to such an end, all might tend to such a thing. And this is only to speak of the known. The vast unknown, it is vain to speculate upon in a brief chatter like this. I would like to remind you here of that idea of mine, that certain forms of so-called hauntings may have their cause in the attractive vibrations. A building, or a ship, just as I have indicated, may develop vibrations, even as certain materials in combination under the proper conditions will certainly develop an electric current. To say more in a talk of this scope is useless. I am more inclined to remind you of the glass which will vibrate to a certain note struck upon a piano, and to silence all your worrying questions with that simple little unanswered one. What is electricity? When we've got that clear, 
it will be time to take the next step in a more dogmatic fashion. We are but speculating on the coasts of a strange country of mystery. In this case, I think the next best step for you all will be home and bed. And with this terse ending, in the most genial way possible, Karnaki ushered us out presently onto the quiet chill of the embankment, replying heartily to our various good nights.